All right. So, Susanna Wesley. So, I, I did miss, you know, one week, so we'll have to skip one. And, I'm, like, I, I think we were going to skip maybe George Whitfield, maybe Spurgeon, one of the one of the two probably, and then we'll um, continue on. But, this morning is Susanna Wesley. You probably have heard of the last name because of her two famous son, John and Charles Wesley, who have been often called the founder and the father of the Methodist faith, the Methodist religion. So Susanna, and rightly so, is often described and talked about as the mother of Methodism, being the mother of John and Charles, who would be the father of Methodist. She was born in 1669. She was the youngest of 25 children. 25. 25. I have two. And I'm already feeling I'm going crazy sometimes. All the same mother. What's that? All the same mother. Correct. No, no, I'm sorry. 24 of the same mother. So, yeah. And obviously this would be throughout, only 24. only 24, and this is obviously throughout the extent of her life to have 24 children, but still, 25, 24 children is quite a feat. She was born in the middle of the aftermath of the English Civil War, so if you know the history of England, you know a little bit about that, and just a couple things on that. If you remember a couple weeks ago, in 1611, King James produced his King James version of the Bible. The, it wasn't the first authorized English translation, but it was the um, one of the bigger ones. He produced that in 1625. James dies, and his son Charles the First comes to the throne, and he becomes the King of England. And it's a long story, which is sort of complicated as to how it all happened. But basically, Charles declares war with Parliament. Parliament doesn't take too kind of being declared war on. And, there, and again, it's a really complicated story. But basically, Charles gets beheaded as the King of England. The king, who was oftentimes beheading everyone else, he gets tried for high treason, sent up to the Tower of London, and gets beheaded through Parliament and through a lot of those guys there. So the king gets beheaded in 1649, and then the question is, who is going to be the next king or the next ruler of England? And a guy steps up named Oliver Cromwell, you've heard of him. He doesn't call himself the king, he calls himself the Lord Protector of England. He's, you know, he's kind of this, away with this monarchical sense of rule. I'm not the king, I'm, I'm the Lord Protector of England. And he's Puritan. And as much as it was a civil war in England, it was also more of a theological civil war between the Anglican church, like Charles, and these Puritans, who remember we talked about that when we talked about the history of the English Bible, under Elizabeth and all this, this Puritan theology, Puritan way of thinking, of whom Cromwell was favorable to. He doesn't last too long. In 1658, he's removed and Charles II comes to the throne, the father of Charles I, who's not too happy that, I'm sorry, the son of Charles I, who's not too happy that his father was beheaded by Parliament and by, by the guys running England. In 1662, one of the things Charles and Parliament does is they pass what's called the Act of uniformity. This was a law that basically said through the through the state of England to all the churches, you have to comply with the Anglican church way of doing things. No more of this on the outside we're Anglican, you know, first Anglican church of Main Street, but inside you're Puritan. No more of this Anglican on the outside sign, but inside you're Puritan in your prayers, you're Puritan in your worship. You have to conform to the Puritan liturgy, the pur I'm sorry, the Anglican liturgy, the, the Anglican prayers, Anglican style of worship. No more of this stuff. 
Not everybody complied to this, and there was about 2,000 guys, clergy in the Anglican Church, who refused to sign this and who refused to comply. One of them was a guy named Samuel Ansley. Samuel Ansley is the father of Susanna Wesley. So, Susanna Wesley, one of 25, grows up under Samuel Ansley, who is a very prominent theological thinker. He's a very well-known church member. He's, he's hanging out with guys like John Owen, famous Puritan. So, Susanna grows up and develops early on a very keen and discerning understanding of theological and spiritual things, well raised by her father, Samuel Ansley. Now, Samuel Ansley is not Anglican. Though he may be on the outside kind of thing, he's Puritan in his theology and Puritan in his thinking. So Susanna's growing up under her father, and at the age of really 12, 11 years old, I'll come over here, she decides that she is not going to embrace this Puritan way of thinking. She's going to remain in the State Church of England as an Anglican. She's not going on with the dissenters movement that her father is a part of. She wants to be a part of this state church. Much to her father's surprise and to, to some extent disapproval. But again, she's keen thinking, she's smart, she's reading all the books in her father's library. She's taught to read, which in those days, young girls were not taught to read. So she's taught to read at a very early age. She's reading her father's material. She develops herself and it's pretty obvious she become quite smart. She gets married at 19 to her husband, Samuel Wesley. She meets him when she's 13. At 19, they get married. And Samuel, like Susanna, Samuel's father was a Puritan clergy member who did was one of these guys who refused to sign the Act of Uniformity, was thrown in jail and ended up dying in prison because of his refusal to go along with the established Church of England. But like Susanna, Samuel did not want to be a part of this Puritan movement. He was going to be established in the Church of England himself, like Susanna. So they get married, they're young. They begin to find, however, they start having problems. And, and in some sense, they don't really, they don't quite fit the mold like they thought they would. Right. You know, sometimes you get married young and you think you know each other and then you start to realize, oh, maybe we don't have as much in common as we thought. It was sort of that kind of deal. But but they they they, they made it work. They, they never got divorced or anything like that. Among other problems was Samuel would her husband was very irresponsible in the way he handled money. And this was going to be a problem throughout their entire marriage and throughout Susanna's entire life. He set them up for a bad, bad situation financially to the point where he never really escaped it. He gets himself in debt in early on years of their marriage. He's unable to pay the debt. And Susanna just lives in poverty really her whole life because of the situation her husband sort of put her in. So it becomes a struggle really financially more than any other thing. Nevertheless, 1690, they have their first child, she would go on to have 19 children. She was one of 25, Susanna would go on to have 19. Not all of them survived past infancy. We, we, we know that, right? We get that in those days, that that was just the way it was, right? Um, but she did go on to have 19. A feed in and of itself, of course. And again, not all of them were surviving past infancy. So in 1695, they had twin boys of whom they passed on early on. In 1696, her father dies and does not leave any money to his daughter. So he has a lot of kids. He divides up all the money. Susanna gets no money. People think that's because of Susanna's decision to remain in the Church of England and not follow this Puritan way of thinking. So as you'll see, the life of Susanna kind of starts here and her high point was, I guess, being born. And it just kind of goes downhill and downhill because she's just not able to catch a break. Born into poverty, born to a, married a husband who sets her, bad, who sets her up for bad financial success. 
children who are dying and then not able to receive any money from her father. In 1697, A couple of you just walked in. We're talking about Susanna Wesley, the, the mother in, of uh, John and Charles Wesley. In 1697, Samuel is invited by the king and queen, who at this point are a couple named William and Mary, who, who, who the college was named after in Virginia. William and Mary, they, he, uh, the king, I'm sorry, the queen invites Samuel to become the pastor at a church in a place called Epworth which was in the country, which was far off in the country. He takes the position because it pays a little better than wherever he's making now. The problem is this was so, so far off in the country. Susanna felt that this was almost an insult to her husband who was far more educated than to be ministering to a bunch of illiterate peasants sort of deal. She described it this way. She said, quote, and I did not know that the almighty wisdom had views and ends Fixing our, I'm sorry, and I did know that the Almighty Wisdom has views and ends and fixed in our habitation, which are out of our ken. I should think it then a thousand pities that a man of his brightness, talking about her husband, and rare endowment of useful learning and knowledge in relation to the Church of God should be conformed to an obscure corner of the country where his talents are buried. So her husband is very bright, very bright theological thinker, very bright pastor, but he's <laughs> ministering in the far off country to people who can't even read. So she's thinking he should be somewhere else where his talent can be more appreciated. Samuel, by the way, would spend his entire life working on a commentary on the book of Job, thinking that would bring him to financial success. This is gonna be a big hit, New York Times bestseller, I'll, I'll go on the shows and I'll promote my book, and it, it never happens. Largely in part because he writes it in Latin, and he's in the countryside, nobody there could read Latin, and it was far too academic for the country people. Samuel begins to realize the, the situation that his family is in. They have no money, the, the parish where he's at is not working out, and he begins to slide into something of a depression. And again, as the time go on, they're having more and more children. Around 1700, Samuel, her husband, leaves Susanna and her children. And for the longest time, the only record we had of this was a letter that John Wesley wrote describing what happened. And it was incredibly weird that a lot of people said this couldn't have really been what happened because it just didn't make any sense. So some people said, you know, John must have been thinking things. Maybe he was dreaming. This, this isn't really what happened. Until about 100 years ago, they found letters from Susanna. And she confirmed this is actually what happened. So this is the reason why her husband left her. Somebody wrote her a letter. And they said, Susanna, try and work things out with her husband. And she writes this in response. This is what she says. Quote, Madam... I'm definitely obliged to you for your charming civility to a person so unworthy of your favors. I must tell you, you have mistaken my case. You advise me to continue with my husband, and God knows I would gladly do it. But there, there is the supreme affliction. He will not live with me. Tis a little while, one morning ago, we were, he observed in our family prayers, I did not say amen to the prayer for King William, the King of England, as I usually do for all others. After this, he retired to his study and he called me asking why I did not say amen. I was a little surprised at the question and I don't know too well what I answered, but too well I remembered what followed. He immediately kneeled down and imprecated the divine vengeance upon himself and all his posterity if he ever touched me or had come to bed with me before I had begged God pardon and as for him, before I had begged God pardon and his pardon for not saying amen. So you follow that? They're, they're in prayer before the meal, whatever it was, and, and her husband prays for the King of England, William, and says amen, and he notices his wife does not say amen. And why is that a problem? Because when you say amen, what does the word mean? It means I agree with everything that's been said, right? I believe it, it is true. Let it be true. That's, that's the essence of when you close a prayer with amen. And he noticed that you did not close uh, the prayer for the king with amen. And that really bothers him. And he said, why did you not do that? And she, you know, she said, I, I didn't really understand the question. 
This, madam, is my unhappy case. I've unsuccessfully represented to him the unlawfulness and unreasonableness of his oath. That man in that case had no more power over his own body than the woman's over hers. That since I'm willing to let him quietly enjoy his opinion, he, not, he ought not to deprive me of the little liberty of conscience. But he has opened up his mouth to the Lord, and what helps? I have no resentment against him. The next day I went to him with communion, that although that night he forsook my bed and had been a stranger ever since. I am almost ashamed to own what extreme disturbance this accident has given me, yet I value not the world, nor my reputation, nor friend, nor anything, in comparison of the single satisfaction of preserving a conscience void of offense toward God and man. How I can do that if I mock Almighty God for what is I think is no sin is past my discerning. But I am inexpressibly miserable, for I can see no possibility of reconciling these differences, though I would submit to anything or do anything for him to live with me. What, what a weird reason to leave your family. And the reason she does not say amen because she does not view uh, William as the true king of England because William was king by marriage and not by blood. So her refusal to say amen, her husband gets angry at him and he leaves her and he's gone for about a year. So think about it, you have, at this point they had, a, I'm not sure how many kids, but quite a few kids. She doesn't have a lot of money. She has no husband. She needs to work the farm. She needs to work the house. She needs to raise these kids. Dire situation. Although she said, I would do anything for him to be back with me. It, it's, you read it with the tone of almost, I don't know what exactly I did. And many people have speculated that he was just so depressed at this point, he just found any reason to leave. While he's gone, their home catches on fire and burns. It does not burn completely to the ground, but it burns enough to destroy a lot of what they have. Her husband Samuel hears about this, and this inclines for him to return. So he comes home and begins rebuilding the home. It's around this time when Susanna really digs in and commits herself to the mothering of her children and the building of the home that she has. So we're going to finish going through her life and then we'll talk about what exactly that looked like. So they come back. Everything seemed to be working a little better. Her husband, although, seemed to have made more enemies than he made friends. Whether it was through owing people money, which he owed a lot of people money, so much so that he would eventually spend some time in prison because he was not paying off his debt. Whether it was through church business, through state business, he just seemed to make enemies more than he made friends. So one example was there were some local guys in the neighborhood who decided they're going to run for office. Samuel gives them his support, and then at, because something happened, he withdraws his support from one of them, creating a mob to be very upset with him for withdrawing his support from from this individual running for office. So one night the mob shows up at their house. Susanna had just given birth to one of her children. She was on bed rest, presumably couldn't really move. The mob showed up and they're there all night, quote, drumming, shouting and firing gun, upset at her husband for what he had done and withdrawing support to someone. And a tragic thing happened. The newborn baby was there. And the nurse who was to care for this newborn baby was up all night trying to just settle this mob. When they finally left, the nurse was so exhausted as to what happened, she fell asleep, rolled over on the newborn baby, and suffocated the baby and killed the baby. So again, you talk about a sad story. She could not catch a break. His enemies kept after Samuel, her husband harassing the house, setting fire to the crops, wounding their animals, and even throwing Samuel in prison to the point where Susanna one time sent her wedding ring to Samuel and said, use this to sell this ring and get, you, get yourself out of prison, although he refused to do that. In 1709, their home catches fire again, and this time it burns to the ground. If you know the life of John Wesley, you know one of the famous instances in his young life was his escape in a fire and at a near-death experience, and this was that fire in 1709. She writes a letter to one of her sons who's off at college, one of her older sons, telling him what happened. 
she said, quote, the fire broke out about 11 or 12 o'clock and we were all in bed. We did not see it happening until the roof of the coin chamber fell on your sister's bed. We had no time to take our clothes. When I was in the yard, I looked for your father and all the children, but seeing none of them, I counted them all as lost. But thank God I was mistaken. Your father carried Emily, Sucky, Patty into the garden. Then missing John ran back into the house to see if he could save him. He heard miserable crying in the nursery and attempted several times to get upstairs, but would beat back by the flame and thought he would lost him and then condemned his soul to God. He went to look for the rest. However, then the child, John, climbed up to the window and called out to them from the yard in which they got a casement and pulled him out just as the roof fell. So she loses her house. It burns down to the ground, almost loses one of her sons. Samuel has to rebuild the house again, and this time he does it in brick. So maybe he learned his lesson. A month later, after all of this happened, she gives birth to her 19th child. Her 19th and last. During the rebuilding of the home, she does send many of her children away to London because she has no place for them to stay. And she's really fearful in doing that because she thinks in sending them away, they're going to be corrupted by the secular teaching that they're teaching over in the schools of London. So when they all come back, she sort of gathers them all together and says, all right, what did you learn there? And they're talking back and forth. And she goes, well, let me, let me tell you why that's wrong. And it's, it's this motherly instinct of homeschooling and correcting the children. After the fire, Samuel starts traveling out of town in an effort to preach at other places in order to get a little bit of money. And again, leaving his wife to do all the work at home. While he leaves, he arranges for another guy to preach in his stead named Inman. He proves to be a very poor preacher, and every Sunday, for an amazing coincidence, he seems to preach on the sin of owing people money and not paying them back. (laughs) Susanna begins to realize she is not being fed by going to church with this guy at the pulpit. So she decides to, every Sunday, she would take her children to church, and then every Sunday afternoon, she would gather all of her children together, go into her husband's library, and read one of his sermons, which were much more spiritually fruitful than this guy's. And she would essentially have a Bible study based off of her husband's sermon. They would sing psalms, they would sing hymns, they would pray, and then she would read these sermons. And it became so popular that next thing you know, it wasn't just her children that were there, but locals. Neighbors, the paper man, the milkman, all of these guys were all coming around and they were beginning to be edified by all of this going on. Inman hears about this and, and eventually comes to the point where more people are going to this afternoon Bible study than are going to Sunday morning. So he doesn't like that. So he writes a letter to Samuel, who, who, her husband, who's away, and said, can, can you please stop this? You know, and Samuel writes to Susanna and said, could, could you at least have a man read the sermon, please? Susanna writes back and said, I'm not in disobedience of the New Testament. I'm not preaching. I'm not teaching. I'm simply reading the sermon. We're having a Bible study. You know, I, I'm not going to stop this. <coughs> she said this, quote, If you do, talk, writing a letter back to her husband, If you do, after all, think fit to, dis- to dissolve this assembly, do not tell me that you desire, I'm sorry, do not tell me that you desire to do it, for that will not satisfy my conscience. But send me your positive command in such full and express terms as may absolve me from guilt and punishment for neglecting this opportunity of doing good when you and I shall appear before the great and awful tribunal of our Lord Jesus Christ. So she said, look, if you want to stop it, you send something with your own signature stopping this. Don't ask me to do it. And she said, may I remind you, husband, you would give an account for this come the day of judgment. So, Ryan, in all of this, this key was... From 1697, when they, they moved to Epworth, he was still the preacher at that church. Even when he left his family and all of this stuff, he was still mm-hmm. the preacher of record, at least, at that. Right. Yep. 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 By all accounts, she she lived the remainder of her life with the same difficulty she, she'd been having in poverty, in debt, with a husband who just did not set his family up for success. And then in 1742, 
she dies in her home surrounded by the remaining children who happen to be in the area. So five of her daughters, Susanna, Emilia, Hetty, Anne, Martha, and then her two sons, John and Charles Wesley. And you know John and Charles, they would eventually go off to Oxford and they would meet a guy named George Whitfield, and then they would become the father figures of the Methodist faith. And the reason they get that name, the Methodist, is because even at Oxford, they were known for being very methodical about the way they went about their spiritual practices. They were very disciplined, they were very rigid, they were very methodical. A lot of it came from their mother and how she raised them. So, that's a sketch of her life, and as, as you see, it's not the happiest life, right? She could not catch a break. And from the standard of the world, from the standard of the culture, you would look at her life and say, that is an unsuccessful life. That was the life of a failure because she was a peasant her whole life and she just never amounted to anything. But Susanna understood something very important. She was absolutely convinced that she could shape a human life, her children, in the everyday events the insignificant, unseemingly everyday events of the home. She was absolutely a believer of that. She was the living, breathing model of Deuteronomy 6, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments I give to you today to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hand, bind them on your forehead, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So she viewed parenthood, she viewed motherhood as this bringing up, educating, discipling, and molding these children to go on to become John and Charles Wesley's of the world. And it was because she absolutely believed that and understood that, that today you can drive down the road and see a sign that said Wesley United Methodist. Why? Because John and Charles Wesley would go on to pioneer this movement largely due to the thanks of the foundation given by their mother, who nobody saw what Susanna was doing. It was in the everyday moment, at the dinner table, when she woke them up, when she put them down. Nobody saw what she was doing. The world didn't see it, it was, but God saw it. And she knew and understood that what she was doing was significant to God. She viewed parenthood and education as discipling your children, even your daughters. She would not teach her daughters how to work until they learned how to read, which in that day, nobody did that. One guy said it this way, quote, As far as she was concerned, the state of their souls formed the focus of her education. Much of what she taught them was for the purpose of helping them see through and therefore be able to resist the secular doctrines of the time. So, in some sense, she may be regarded not only as the inventor of homeschooling, but also what is today sometimes called worldview teaching. Something modern Christian parents in the West have begun embracing as they raise their children in an increasingly post-Christian culture. So, how did she do it? Here's a couple things. Number one, before they could walk or talk, she would teach her children how to offer a blessing at the meal using sign languages. You know, whether you have the kid raise your hand or fold them in a prayer thing, shoot, instilling this at an early age, building their mind to say a blessing for their food. She helped them memorize prayers and had them recite the Lord's Prayer every morning and every evening when they wake up and when they lie down, right? Deuteronomy 6. She couldn't find a textbook she wanted to use, so she wrote her own textbook. She used that as a way of teaching her kids. They began and closed each academic day by singing a hymn or reading from the Bible. They studied three hours in the a.m., three hours in the p.m., and then they rested on the Sabbath. She kept all of her children on a strict schedule rather than doing things on demand, especially feeding. And that would probably more so because they didn't have a lot of food, so she couldn't just simply feed them on demand. They didn't have the money to buy the food. They couldn't run down to Publix. They didn't have the food. She did not teach her daughters how to work until they learned how to read. And she was incredibly intentional about, about who she would spend time with. She would block off certain amounts of time. This, you know, 
it's Friday afternoon from two to four. Charles, you and me are gonna go for a walk and let's talk about your struggles and division, you know? And it was that intentional one-on-one -on -one building of the time, blocking off time and being very intentional, keeping a strict calendar as to how she would do it. If you were ever to Google Susanna Wesley homeschooling or anything like that, you may come across what's called Susanna Wesley's 16 rules for raising godly kids. And to, to my knowledge, she never wrote down like, these are my 16 rules. I think somebody put this together from all of her letters. She never kept a diary, she never wrote a book, but she wrote letters. So whatever, what, what we know from her, we're able to pull from these letters. So here are the 16. And some of these are restricted to the time she lived in. So number one, eating between meals is not allowed. That, again, that would probably be because they didn't have the food to do that. Number two, children are to be in bed by 8 p.m. Number three, they are required to take medicine without complaining. That's a good rule. I like that rule. Subdue self-will in a child and those working together to go and those working together with God to save the child's soul. So she understood that all of her children, like all of us, don't, they don't we don't come into the world as Christian. We come into the world, right? Ephesians two as children of wrath. So she said, I want to save my child's soul. Number five, to teach a child to pray as soon as the child can speak. Number six, require everyone to be still during family worship. Number seven, give them nothing that they cry for and only when they ask politely. Number eight, to prevent lying, punish no fault when it is first confessed of and repented of. Number nine, never allow a sinful act to go unpunished. Number 10, never punish a child twice for single offenses. Number 11, comment and reward good behavior. Number 12, any attempt to please, if prop, even if poorly performed, should be commended. 13, preserve property rights, even in the smallest matters. 15, require no daughter to work before she can read well. And then 16, teach children to fear the rod. Can you see why she's the mother of the Methodist faith? What a very methodical way of going about things. And when you have 19 kids, how else can you do it? This is from Susanna from a letter she wrote. And this, this just, I love this. It captures the heart behind what she was about. She'd write into someone else. She says, quote, Though the education of so many children must create an abundance of trouble and will perpetually keep the mind employed as well as the body, Yet consider this no small honor to be entrusted with the care of so many souls. It will certainly be no little ascension to the future glory to stand forth and say at the last day, Lord, here are my children, which thou hast given me, of whom I lost none by my ill example, nor by neglecting to instill in their mind in the early years the principles of thy true religion. I love that. It is no small task to do the insignificant thing and to at the last day stand and say, God, here are my children whom you've given me, of whom I've lost none, of whom I've taught the Christian faith. Here they are. She understood that. And I think she, she understood and lived the fact that this was all done in the everyday moments, the insignificant things of feeding the children. And I know, I know most of you, yeah, most of you here are, have probably have been parents, grandparents. You you know this. But you don't get a reward for being a parent. That's the thing. You know, no, nobody really cares. You can get a reward if you can put a ball through a hoop or, you know, can run really fast. But sometimes the world doesn't value what God values. And Susanna understood that. And she said, though I'm not going to be a world famous, you know, theological scholar, whatever it be, I can be faithful in the everyday moments of being a mother, being a parent, to raise John and Charles Wesley of the world. It, it's encouraging because we may not be the next St. Augustine, you know, the next Martin Luther, Jonathan Edwards. We probably won't be. But we can all take something from this in learning how to be faithful in doing the small things right, correctly, and to God, who will one day reward us. So that's the encouragement I think we can glean from.
this is a class on giants of church history. All of the other ones have truly been giants, right? By any standard, Susanna wouldn't be considered a giant. She never wrote a book, never developed a theological, you know, formula or opinion, never nailed 95 theses to the door, never did any of that, but she understood the faithfulness of the insignificance and how God sees what she did just as important as what he saw Martin Luther did. It was timely for me this week because this past week, as you know, we had a baby, so the past week was filled with diapers and bottles and screaming babies and two-year-olds fighting for attention. And it was a reminder to me this week personally, like, the Lord sees this and it does not go unnoticed. Does anyone have final thoughts or questions about it? Yeah. I almost said goals, but no. How much did she get to see of her children? You know, she saw a little bit with John and Charles. By the time she died, they were sort of establishing themselves as um, these, these growing figures at Oxford. Uh, and some of her other sons were off in college as well doing things. So she was able to see some of it. In terms of the, the success they had in the Americas, I'm not too sure about that, you know. John especially, you know, all the work he did. How long did Samuel live? Uh, her husband? Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure which one died first either. All right, well, let's, let's close with a prayer and we will be done. Father, thank you that you are a God who is not a respecter of persons nor of statuses. And each and every one of us and what we do matters to you. And the, the small insignificant tasks that the world tells us does not matter. We know it matters to you. We know you see things. We know that there is coming a day when we will give an account for our life. Not for, not for our sin, but for our life and the work that we do. And we pray we keep that in mind each and every day. In, in the frustrating moments of life, we pray you bring this to our hearts as a reminder that you care and you see and you, you will reward. Father, thank you for the grace that you give us. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the church. And we pray, Father, for this upcoming week. We pray for BBS, that it is safe, joy-filled, and that the gospel resonate throughout. In your name we pray. Amen.